It's hard to describe the feeling that comes with starting your own business. It really is so much work in the beginning that you lose yourself in it. You lose your sense of time and you can't believe how quickly the days go by because there's no time to focus on much of anything else. But then you open the doors and it's like you've given birth to this new thing that didn't exist before. Then when it starts to flourish, well, that's just icing on the cake. To get to see it live and breathe and to know that this thing you've created out of thin air can put a smile on other people's faces is such a blessing. There were some women who would come into that store and drop $1,500 in a single visit. It was unbelievable. But I think one of my favorite customers I had in that first year of Magnolia was a woman who didn't ever buy a thing. She would just show up now and then and poke around. And she told me one time, I just come here because I want to be in here. This place inspires me. That was just about the greatest compliment I could ever imagine. She affirmed for me that I had accomplished exactly what I'd set out to do, and that made me even more passionate about creating an experience for my customers. I worked every day to come up with new touches that would make the experience memorable. I never got too comfortable with any particular look or design. I wanted to constantly challenge myself and make it better. If people were going to go out of their way to come into my store, I wanted to make sure it was worthwhile, whether they bought something or not. Sometimes the thing we're dreaming of doesn't work out, but Chip and I weren't going to give up on the idea of opening my shop just because the building I fell in love with seemed to slip through our fingers. So we kept on looking for other buildings. We searched and searched, but nothing we found had the character or the charm of that little spot on Bosky. I was starting to lose hope when a few weeks into our renewed search, my prayers were suddenly answered. Maybelle called me on my cell phone. Joanna, I've been praying about it, and I do not know why, but I feel very strongly that God is saying I need to sell this building to you for $45,000. I could hardly believe it. God made it so evident this was meant to be. I was about to open my very own business. Some friends and family members tried to talk me out of doing this. They felt it was just too big of a risk to take because I had no experience running a business of my own, no training in retail sales or marketing. I had never owned property before, and I knew next to nothing about home decor or design. Truly, the only home decorating I'd ever done was in the house where we currently were living, and that had just been one big experiment for me. But Chip did what Chip does and made all those facts, all that logic, seem irrelevant. He really did. He believed I could do it, and he was confident that what I didn't know, I could learn. I think part of what originally drew me to TV journalism was that I was a curious observer of other people. I may have been the quiet girl, but I was always the one who watched how things worked and took everything in. I told Chip all about how things worked in those shops in New York. Time spent by shoppers in those little boutiques was a sensory experience, and the store owners made sure of it. Women, especially, noticed these kinds of details. The sweet smell of a candle burning, the color of a fresh bouquet of flowers next to the register, the music softly playing in the background, the allure of an interesting display— All of those things I'd mentioned earlier. As a shopper and a careful observer, I was able to appreciate the creative process that went into each little table and window installation. In that sense, I wanted to create a store that was an experience, not just a collection of things for people to buy. I wanted to design it with intention and be sure I set things up to catch the eye of my shoppers. I also wanted to make sure my displays were practical and inspired my visitors to know that they too could set up their homes like this. My goal was to make design relatable, to make it attainable. We took some time renovating that little house-like shop while I finished up our remodeling at home, and in the process, I started collecting inventory. I bought inexpensive merchandise at the Dallas Market Center, an incredible wholesale marketplace filled with items sourced from all over the world. I hit garage sales and flea markets, too, and found old mirrors and furniture and knickknacks that I could fix up or distress to make them more appealing while adding some value to them. At one point, I found a large brown wicker sleigh for five bucks. I couldn't believe how cheap it was. I thought to myself, if I could dress this thing up a bit, I could sell it for $25. Off to the local craft store I went. I found a fake ivy garland to wrap all around the sleigh and some battery-operated Christmas lights that I tucked into the ivy. I was so proud of the way it turned out that I thought maybe I could sell it before the shop even opened and get a taste for how this would all work. So I talked my father into putting it in his waiting area at Firestone with a price tag on it. But a week went by and I noticed the sleigh was still there. The second week, I called my dad, yes, Jojo, it's still here, but don't worry, it will sell. The third week went by and I told my dad that if it didn't sell, I would just come pick it up and get it out of the way. At that point, I felt deflated. I questioned more than ever if running a store was what I was supposed to be doing. But I went in toward the end of that third week, and my father handed me an envelope with $25 in it. 
I told you you would sell it, he said. Now go buy something for $20 and see if you can sell it for 50 bucks. This is how retail works, Jojo. Selling that sleigh made me feel like I could do this design thing despite the odds and my lack of experience. But the more I shopped for bargains that I could turn around for profit, the harder it was to choose between what I wanted to sell and what I wanted to use to finish turning our house into a home over on 3rd Street. It took nearly eight months to get it to the point where that yellow house finally felt finished. I was so happy to be done and to be free of the dust and debris and tools everywhere and to finally get the place neatened up and livable. I don't like a lot of clutter. I like a clean house. If my house is too messy, I just can't think straight. And remodeling a house is messy by definition. So nearly eight months after being carried into a house full of rotten meat and dog urine, I was thrilled to finally have a place where we could be comfortable. I was proud of what we'd done, too. I hoped we'd live there for a long time, and I was ready to focus all of my energies on the shop. Then Chip came home one afternoon and said, Hey, Joe, I bought a new house. Oh, I said, to rent out? Well, eventually, yeah, we're going to be able to rent this house out now because we fixed it up. It's ready to go. So let's move down to this next house a few doors down and we'll fix that one up too, as nice as we made this one. We'll be able to make better rent on everything if we make all of them look this good. As I rode down the street with him to see what he'd bought, I was in shock when he pulled up in front of this tiny white box of a house. I mean tiny. Maybe 800 square feet. There was no cute front porch. The yard, front and back, was all weeds and overgrown bushes. When he opened the front door of that cabin-sized house, I could see it hadn't been touched in 30 years. And she cried. Again. That was sort of her thing during year one. If we ever write a marriage book, I think chapter one will be called She Cried. Chip assured me this was the right thing to do. This was how we were going to get ahead and make real money. He tried to remind me of the fun I'd had fixing up the yellow house, and I had to admit that some parts of it had been fun. I'd love coming up with the themes for the rooms and picking out all the colors and textures and learning how to do the work myself. But the yellow house wasn't just some house to me after doing all of that work. It was my house. It was our home. But Chip never saw it like that. He really never got attached to anything that didn't have a heartbeat. These houses, they were just inventory to him. He liked messing with them, but he certainly didn't want to live in any one of them forever. Even though he didn't understand why I was so upset, he was smart enough to just leave me alone for a little while. I went back home and sat on the porch and thought, how can we just rent this house out to college kids? My house. We'd only been in there eight months. Then I got to thinking about how much work it had been, and the idea of starting from scratch again seemed daunting, especially with everything I was trying to get done to the shop so it could open up. I cried it out until I reached a point where I realized there was nothing much I could do about it. He's already bought it, so we're kind of in this now. No one's going to rent that little white house in the condition it's in. One thing I learned there on that beautiful front porch was if I wanted to be successful, if I wanted to do important work one day, I would have to increase my capacity. I had to learn to manage disappointment. I needed to learn how to make the most out of these opportunities Chip seemed to keep finding. So I told Chip, okay. We rented our house out that very week to some college students and moved ourselves down the block. We started renovating again. And because this house was half the size and I was already actively out there looking for inventory for the shop, it didn't take nearly as long to get everything finished. We did suffer a few setbacks, like the time Chip decided to surprise me by using maroon grout on the white tile in the kitchen. He could tell I didn't like it the moment I walked into the room, and he wound up ripping it all out and doing it all over again. I'm not sure why I had such clear ideas about what I liked and I didn't like, but I did. And the funny thing is that after a couple of months, once I put my stamp on it, I was as much in love with that little house as I had been with the yellow one. She still jokes to this day that I like that house because I could vacuum the whole place without ever unplugging the cord. I could plug into one outlet and vacuum every room. I love that. It's true. Back at my shop, the one thing I was having a hard time designing was a sign for the front of the building. Chip and I had decided together that a little shop would be named Magnolia. I've always loved magnolia trees and their blooms. There's something so beautiful about a magnolia blossom. It demands attention, and you can't help but love those big, creamy petals and that fragrant smell. We'd handed out magnolia leaves at our wedding, and we'd had those two beautiful magnolia trees in the front of our first home together, so magnolias have always seemed like a part of us. Plus, they just seemed so entirely Southern. They reminded me of drinking sweet tea on the big wraparound porch of a 19th century plantation home or something. The name Magnolia just fit my business and the feeling I wanted to create. 
We loved it, but I really struggled with how to put the name on that sign. I figured I would have to hand paint the thing since I didn't have a budget to have anything professionally made, and I just couldn't come up with anything that worked. I kept drawing things out, trying to write the word magnolia in different ways, using the flower itself in a logo of sorts, and it just never felt right to me. Then one day Chip showed up with the back of his pickup truck, just loaded with old metal letters he'd found at a flea market. Big, oddly shaped letters taken from various old signs. They were mismatched and rusty and dented, and I loved them. We tacked them up on the front of the shop, spelling out the name that would come to mean so much. Magnolia. The letters were uneven and looked a little handmade and ragged, but it seemed to work. I loved the sign because Chip designed it and made it with his own two hands. It came together in such an imperfectly perfect way, and I hoped people would get it. To this day, that sign is one of my proudest accomplishments. I mean, I'm no Joanna Gaines, but I certainly see things a little bit differently and love design in my own way. The first sign really reflected that for me. I would glow when I would hear a customer come in the shop and say, I saw the sign and just had to stop in. Finally, in October of 2005, the shop was ready to go. In a rush, I hand-painted a dinky little open sign, but I ran out of space for the inn, so it dropped down at the end. It was just bad. I didn't have an advertising budget, and I hadn't done anything in marketing at all. We told plenty of people we knew, of course, and our parents had spread the word, but I was basically hoping that people would see my store when they were driving by and drop in. And yet I put out a sign on my opening day that looked like a four-year-old had drawn it. It was pretty pathetic. Inside, the shop was pretty much everything I wanted it to be. In addition to the home decor items, I had a section full of fresh flowers for sale. They smelled so good and looked perfect. When I was in New York, I had lived next to a flower shop, and I'd love watching people walk out with fresh flowers wrapped in craft paper. I wanted to create that same feel in Waco, Texas that I experienced in New York City. So I had the flowers all ready to go, I had the candles burning, I had Frank Sinatra music playing, and at 9.55 a.m., just five minutes before the doors open, I started to freak out. She was hyperventilating. I mean, no joke. I thought I was going to have to take her to the emergency room or something. She was so nervous. I just started panicking. No one's going to come. Why is no one here? Chip and I had done the math. I needed to make at least $200 a day in order to pay the mortgage and insurance and electricity. That was $200 every day we were open just to stay afloat, without any profits. I'd been working so hard getting everything ready that I hadn't stopped to think about what might happen if the store didn't make that much money. I was close to a complete nervous breakdown thinking, what if this doesn't work? Then, just after 10 o'clock, a Hummer pulled into the parking lot, followed by this beautiful Mercedes, followed by a Suburban, and then a BMW. All these rich women showed up out of nowhere. They were doctors and lawyers' wives, stay-at-home moms and grandmothers who loved to shop and who did their best to make their homes feel nice. It turned out they'd all been watching my little shop come together during the renovations. They'd been eagerly anticipating my opening day for weeks, and it seemed that my idea of bringing a New York-style boutique experience to a home decor store wasn't far-fetched at all. There were a lot of people in town who were excited for it. My first day we opened, we made $2,800. By the way, my dad decided to sell his Firestone shop shortly after this. I went over and helped him clean out the attic one day, and guess what I found up there? The wicker sleigh that I'd fixed up nice with the garland and Christmas lights that I'd put up for sale in his lobby. It was still tucked in a corner. I just shook my head. He bought it himself to give me a little boost of confidence as I got ready to open my store. What can I say? It worked, and so did the shop. Sometimes when something is meant to be, It's meant to be. It had nothing to do with how I advertise, and it certainly didn't have anything to do with my being some kind of an amazing designer or having a reputation, because I wasn't any kind of designer at all, and no one knew who I was. I just knew what I liked, and I trusted that other people might like it too. And I was where I was supposed to be. I'd listened to my own intuition and let God guide me toward the plans he'd had for me all along. I mean, is there anyone who could possibly imagine that the way to get your life's calling would be to marry a guy who showed up an hour and a half late to your first date, and then to let that man talk you into opening your own small business in the first year of marriage? But guess what? It all seemed to be working out in the perfectly messy way life works when you trust in God and His plans for your life rather than focusing on your own. At that point, I wasn't anywhere near used to the dynamics of it all. Chip's impulsive buying of properties, the way I'd hate them at first and then come to love them, only to have to move out again, the unexpected twists and turns and the hardships we'd have to overcome to get ourselves back on course, all of that was still new to me. 
And as we repeated them over the next few years, moving from flip house to flip house and starting over again and again, there would be a whole lot of tears. But the fact that we established that crazy pattern of doing things in our own unique way so early on in our marriage was important. It prepared us for everything that would come later on. And Chip's decision to move us into that little white 800 square foot house worked out exactly the way he said it would. It helped us get ahead and start making some sustainable income. One of the real pluses to that second house was that it had this big side yard. We could subdivide it, and we could build a whole second house to rent or sell right next to the one that we were living in. I bought that house, lot included, for $30,000, and we probably put about $25,000 into it. So we were all in for fifty-five grand on that little house, and it turned out to be beautiful. It really did. And we were able to build a brand new house next door for about $130,000. And of course, this was all debt. We didn't own anything outright. And getting the money to do all this hadn't come easy. The banks hadn't wanted to mess around with these little houses at first. They were either small potatoes, or the banks felt like I needed to build a reputation first. The few they actually had agreed to caused us to go scrambling every month just to make the payments and pay our own bills. When it came to remodeling, we never took out any walls or did any major construction at that point. Everything was just cosmetic, but we tried to do things creatively and nice. We updated the kitchen with new appliances, and we'd use the existing cabinets and learn how to repaint them. We put in new countertops and a new backsplash when we could. We restored the hardwood floors, and I mean lots of them. Chip literally became an expert in setting tile and wood floor restoration. We took out the bathtub and replaced it with a nice wide shower with multiple shower heads and some body jets. Honestly, it felt luxurious, like the kind of shower you'd find in a really upscale house or a spa somewhere. Then came the paint, and we were done. And by that point, as I've mentioned, I would be in love with the place. But it wasn't just the work we put in that made me love that tiny white house. It wasn't even the easy vacuuming, though it was a plus. What made that house special was the incredible memories we made there. We threw Chip's 30th birthday party in that house's little backyard. I strung Christmas lights in the trees, and Chip built a fire pit that was unbelievable. We didn't have much in the way of backyard furniture, so I put hay bales all around the perimeter for people to sit on. There was a little old weather shed in the back, and I lit that up too. It looked like something you'd see in a magazine. It was one of the best parties I'd ever seen in my life. It was funny because we were basically poor. We didn't know how we were going to pay our bills from month to month. And we were living in this tiny little house, and I'd gone and invited all these college buddies to this party who had gone off and started making real money. They came in from Dallas and Austin and parked their Beamers and their Range Rovers up in the lawn of this tiny little $30,000 property we owned. But we were proud of that house. We didn't think anything of it, and we were excited to have all of our friends from college there to see what we'd been up to and to celebrate Chip's 30th birthday together. I was 30 years old and still living by the seat of my pants. I probably should have had my life together a little bit more by this point. But the thing was, my friends all had these stressed out lives, and they came to our place, and it felt like we were just living this laid back, beautiful, no stress life. We made being poor look a lot of fun. All these corporate friends of ours were thinking, well, maybe it wouldn't have been that bad to stay in Waco after all. It wasn't just my friends that made that party special, though. My grandma was still alive at that time, and she came to that party, too. She was just the sweetest lady in the world. She had single-handedly raised my dad and his brother. And though she had a very tough life, you would have never known it by her attitude. Between my mom and my grandma, I was definitely genetically built for a positive optimism. That day with her was one of my fondest memories because she and I hung out on these bales of hay out behind this house for hours. It wasn't but a couple of years after that that she went to be with Jesus. We made all kinds of big memories in that tiny house, and we were just getting started. The fact that we had some profits starting to roll in from my little shop on Bosky only added to the sense of security we were building. It's hard to describe the feeling that comes with starting your own business. It really is so much work in the beginning that you lose yourself in it. You lose your sense of time, and you can't believe how quickly the days go by because there's no time to focus on much of anything else. But then you open the doors, and it's like you've given birth to this new thing that didn't exist before. Then when it starts to flourish, well, that's just icing on the cake. To get to see it live and breathe and to know that this thing you've created out of thin air can put a smile on other people's faces is such a blessing. There were some women who would come into that store and drop $1,500 in a single visit. It was unbelievable. But I think one of my favorite customers I had in that first year of Magnolia was a woman who didn't ever buy a thing. 
She would just show up now and then and poke around. And she told me one time, I just come here because I want to be in here. This place inspires me. That was just about the greatest compliment I could ever imagine. She affirmed for me that I had accomplished exactly what I'd set out to do, and that made me even more passionate about creating an experience for my customers. I worked every day to come up with new touches that would make the experience memorable. I never got too comfortable with any particular look or design. I wanted to constantly challenge myself and make it better. If people were going to go out of their way to come into my store, I wanted to make sure it was worthwhile, whether they bought something or not. Magnolia was my baby, no doubt about that, but it wasn't long before I heard